I'm gonna chrono your ammo. Oh, oh camera. Oh, 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 <laughs> yeah. Emotional damage. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the weekly English shooting live stream. That joke is never going to get old. There's going to be many more moments to come. I can reassure you. Paul has left the building. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for joining. I hope you've had a fantastic uh, week, hopefully a shooting week, a uh, shooting field week. Uh, but yes, uh, tonight is the English shooting live stream. Where we're going to talk about all the past week's shooting news and topics. And I'm afraid to say, unfortunately, it's, uh, oh, it's going from bad to worse really um but before we get into that of course make sure you hit that like button it really does help the channel grow and reach new people in sharing this sport subscribe if you're not already subscribed and if you want to support the channel you can either head over to englishshooting.org where you can get some cool merch or you can even join the only es fans uh, on the channel there'll be a join button along the subscribe and like button as well where you can learn a little bit more about that so some really big news again about firearms licensing again about uh, Plymouth Devon and Cornwall firearms licensing the constant revocations constant people having their guns seized for seemingly no good reason um, and this is actually a story that we have sort of previously covered to some extent well we've covered the the general story of this quite in depth but there has been a specific case which we have visited previously which has sparked this potential new death nail into this sport and you know I'm not exaggerating when I say that this really is something that is quite severe and it's certainly a mechanism that could be used to ban guns in the UK without actually banning guns if people can't get their certificates if they can't maintain their certificates then they can't own the firearms they can't go and buy the firearms which inadvertently kills the sport it's uh, it's certainly a, a, more of a backdoor ban and they are being very very sneaky about it and I don't know why this isn't receiving more attention. I don't know why, from the looks of it, Basque isn't on this. The Countryside Alliance isn't on this. Really, the entire shooting community should be behind this guy and fighting this corner because if he loses, we all lose. So this is uh, this is where we've sort of left it previously. Uh, so it's this gentleman here. Um, this is all from Field Sports Britain. They're doing an amazing job of covering uh, all of this. They can get sort of all around the country. Um, but it's Andrew Elger, who last, I think it was last August, last September, a month, around a month after his renewal. So they went through the normal process, uh, tested his suitability. They you know, said that he was he was fit to, to own firearms, renewed his license, gave it to him. Well, then he got a knock on the door from armed police to seize his guns. I don't know if that at that time a revocation was issued or whether he voluntarily surrendered that, uh, surrendered his firearms, which we've discussed the pitfalls, <laughs> pros and cons of doing that previously. But ultimately, it has ended up with him in court. Now, this article... Uh, was from November last year. So we're talking nearly a year since this was really highlighted. Uh, and it's now, I think, getting on for like 18 months that he's lost his certificates. And the really sort of warning sign of all of this, of what we potentially could have to deal with in future, is that he still hasn't had any reason for why they took his firearms away. Now, this guy is managing land. He's using it for his livelihood. He's using it for his job and living, right? This isn't just a hobbyist shooting bits of, you know, shooting holes in paper. This guy needs his guns for the work that he does. And this has um, developed even, uh, even further, which is this story here. Um, so this is what we saw you know, a few days ago. Uh, so Andrew Elgar far left at Exeter Crown Court with his support team of deer stalking character references. Uh, Andrew is the guinea pig for police attempts to invoke 
public interest immunity in FAC cases. That is, the police can take away your certificates and don't have to tell you why. The case continues. Then today there was an update in there uh, in the news. So Field Sports Channel News does uh, an amazing job again every week of doing a little uh, their news stump, I think they call it. Uh, and they do this article. I don't know if the is the sound going to come through to you guys? Probably not. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, I should have downloaded the video. But basically, the application has been put in to use this public interest immunity so that the police don't have to, have to give them a reason. Now, this is something that I've explored previously myself, and it's it's very much around the security services and you know, information and data that may be considered, you know, at a risk of compromising national security. And, you know, the best place for this sort of stuff, right here on MI5's website, you talk about evidence and disclosure. And the bit that you really want to, to have a look at, at um, have a look at, uh, we go, we go through from this top paragraph here, um, claims for PII in relation to our material are made on the basis of a certific certificate signed by the Secretary of State. You know, you're, this isn't like a minor thing. This isn't just another process in the court. This involves some pretty high level uh, people. I think this the, the Secretary of State is specific in MI5, but it's not an easy thing to go and get. And you do need a bloody good reason for why you are applying for it. Um, in deciding whether a claim is appropriate, the Home Secretary has to carry out a careful balancing exercise, the competing public interest and the administration of justice and the protection of national security must be weighed. This exercise takes account of detailed advice from prosecuting counsel on the relevance of the materials to the issues in the case. If the Home Secretary considers that the balance favours non-disclosure, a claim for PII will be made, but the decision on a PII claim is ultimately one for the tri trial, trial judge alone. The court, not MI5 or the government, ultimately decide what must be disclosed in a particular case. If a claim is accepted, the judge will never, nevertheless continue to keep the decision to authorise non-disclosure of the sensitive material under review throughout the proceedings. Now, I will just caveat and, and put my hands up and say, I'm not a, a legal expert. Understanding the law to a T is a very difficult job and it takes years of, of training and experience uh, to, to do so. What I can personally read from that is that with this case at the moment with Demon and Cornwall Firearms Licensing, they're trying to say we have a really good reason why we've revoked this person's certificates. We just can't publicly disclose that. And publicly is obviously in, in the greater public, but also it can't be disclosed to the defense team of Andrew who's trying to get his certificates back. The only person that can you know, sort of be made aware of it is the judge. And then the judge has to make a decision. Yeah, is this relevant? Is it going to harm national security? Should it be disclosed within this case? Um, and if they make the decision that the PII claim is valid, then they can basically turn around to the defense and say, there is a really good reason that we can't talk about, we can't tell you what it is, and most importantly, and what why this is incredibly dangerous for firearms owners across the country, can't be defended against. It It is almost a dead cert win for the prosecution, for the police, for the firearms licensing, if a PII is... Um, is upheld because how do you defend against something that you don't know and the judge ultimately has to has to go well there's no argument against it this must be uh, this must be the truth this is the main serious reason why this guy doesn't have certificates therefore i'm going to uphold the revocation you will never find out why your licenses have been revoked and again most importantly you will never have the opportunity to be able to defend against it this PII as it 
you know, that shows on the MI5's website. This is stuff that is usually involving the security services. It's, it's involving agencies that are incredibly secretive and incredibly powerful. Now, whilst I understand there is very much a big connection between firearms and counterterrorism and maybe even the security services, and, and whilst you never want to judge a book by its cover either way, I'm sorry, but why are the security services interested in this guy? Somebody that wants to, you know, go around on this quad bike shooting a few deers. I mean, like, you never know. Again, never judge a book by their cover. But, you know, does that look like the mastermind of some terrorist ring to you? Does that look like somebody that's really involved in stuff that the security services are going to be interested in? And... You have to ask what, like, you know, there's there's still a very good, I say very good, there's still a chance, some chance that, yes, this guy has been doing stuff that the security services are aware of that, you know, is going to make him unfit to, to hold a firearms, uh, firearms certificate. But why were his firearms certificates renewed in the first place? If, if this guy is some really serious criminal or some potential terrorist, why did they ever renew his certificates in the first place? Then that starts to ask more questions about what else could they be trying to hide? Is this a case of Devon and Cornwall have made some serious questionable decisions and they are they really don't want to sort of crack and open this case up and expose the fact that they have just gone round needlessly without justification causing people pretty significant distress in taking away tools required for their livelihood is is this to show is this to cover some potential greater conspiracy that is going on around Devon and Cornwall or even firearms licensing as a whole it does really start to ask a hell of a lot more questions than it certainly seems to answer but don't underplay this don't think oh it's just one guy if he can't get his certificates back what does that what does that matter to me this case could potentially set precedent for the rest of the country, for every other firearms licensing department up and down the country. If one gets away with this PII, then the rest will try it as well. We are going to then end up in a situation where you have armed police knock on your door. They're going to take the, the guns whether or not you are offered a voluntary surrender or not. And you are never going to have the opportunity to at least fairly fight to get them back. Once you have that PII as a black mark on your file, on your name, then you are pretty much done for. So again, I, I really don't know why at the moment only Field Sports Britain is covering this story. This should be across every shooting organization's website. You know, Basque, they removed their legal expenses insurance. I don't know if this person is or was a, a Basque member and whether Basque's insurance would have kicked in if he if he was when they had the insurance but let's not forget that they have this magical seven figure fighting fund which they are able to allocate to cases that they deem are for the greater benefits or firearms owners and shooters across the whole of the UK I very much think a significant of proportion should be allocated to this if needed now everyone else can sort of do their um do their part uh, if you head over to let me see if i can get the uh, get the link there is um i think they said there was a link in i wasn't actually actually able to able to find it let me see if i can get it there is a donation link so this guy as far as i believe from what i can remember of the previous trial he was having to self-fund it. He didn't actually have any insurance and he's self-funding this. Again, this is imperative that this is one for the whole of, uh, here we go, I've got I've got the link. Now I just need to get it over to the, uh, the other Mac. No, the other Mac. Uh, <laughs> oh, always well prepared. Here we go, just a little bit of Facebook switchery. So yeah, if you if you want to support this guy like seriously, like maybe maybe even just not have your Starbucks tomorrow, maybe not have your um, your Costa tomorrow. Save the uh, save the coffee, make one at home, 
and donate what you would normally pay for a coffee in a day to um, to this GoFundMe link incoming. It is, yeah, I, I again, this is, you know, there's all various um, thoughts and theories of, uh, here we go, I think that, I think that should work. Is that link working? Just test it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, on the page, I can bring that up for you guys on here. It is, it is a bit of a confusing process having to use two different um, two different computers to stream. Uh, but yeah, if you click through the link that I've just put in the chat, uh, then you're going to come through uh, to this page. Uh, Stop police seizing guns for no reason. Again, once this is obviously about this person specifically, then you know this is a is a case that is going to either help or hinder the rest of the people within Devon and Cornwall and the rest of the people up and down the country that have had their guns seized for seemingly no good reason. It's one thing to have a really weak reason for seizing your guns, like at least that gives you a, an opportunity to go in and fight that in court, but have no reason at all. This is very much where it could be beheading. Uh, so uh, my name is Andrew Elgar. I'm a deer stalker and pest controller from Devon. In August 2021, I renewed my shotgun and rifle certificates as I do every five years without trouble. At the end of August, armed police seized my guns. Since then, Devon and Cornwall police have not told me why. I am appealing against the revocation of my certificate. Part of the appeal is to get my guns back. The other part is to stop police claiming public interest immunity when they seize guns and revoke certificates. If the police get away with this, they will be able to seize anybody's guns and not tell them why. It took 10 months to get my first court case. That costs several thousand, which unfortunately is not money I have. I have sold my house and I am using those funds. If you value your shotgun or rifle certificate, please can you help me fund the next stage of my case? It is on the 7th of October 2022. Here's the story uh, so far. So again, you, you can, I, I hope this really does drive home this, the seriousness of this case for the whole of the country, not just this individual, not just Devon and Cornwall Police, but the entire country. And this was a, a further update, actually, where the police are sort of just jerking him, jerking him around because uh, the, the update that I'd forgotten about with him is that the they turned up to the court um, to have this uh, initial trial. Uh, did it say the date again? Um, so yeah, it took 10 months to get the first court case. So he goes into court and the police just turn around and go, yeah, we're not ready. Um, we're, uh, we, we haven't got everything put together. So they ended up having to postpone it and, you know, back to October the, the 7th. And you're thinking, you've had 10 months, right? You know, the reason that you have taken this guy's guns away, you know that reason, right? So so tell everyone. And again, this is why it seems to be sort of very fishy is, well, on the first court date, they didn't have all the relevant documents, they didn't have the relevant evidence to produce, and they needed an extension, they needed a little bit more time. And then the next time in court, they submit an application for public interest immunity. You really have to question whether or not they actually have anything on this guy or whether they are just using public interest immunity to to win this case and not expose the fact that they have pretty much randomly destroyed somebody's life. I mean, I, I wasn't aware of that. The guy sold his house. And, and this is why, as firearms owners... And why I am still so passionately angry at Basque for removing their legal expenses insurance, because you have to self-fund this. Like, if if you win, yes, your costs can be recovered. I believe the costs are only the costs of the day. But if you speak to a solicitor, if you, you write to a solicitor, or they write to you, or they speak to you, you're pretty much being charged by the minute, and it can take weeks and weeks of work to even enter a courtroom. So thousands of pounds that you are on the hook personally for even before you end up in court and then even a simple court case can cost thousands of thousands of pounds. I've said it many times before when I lost my appeal 
fortunately at the time I was a Basque member and Basque had their legal expenses insurance the expenses of the other side just the other side was I think two and a half thousand three thousand pounds that's not in including the cost of my own legal team my barrister and my solicitor for the day and again the prep work running into it this was as you know six six odd years ago now costs have only gone up as well where we know you're probably looking in the ballpark for a simple appeal now if you lose and you have to pay their cost as well upwards of ten thousand pounds as a side note i really cannot stress enough that you have legal expenses insurance there are plenty of organizations that still uh, offer it i believe the national um, gamekeepers association the J uh, organization the ngo um, do it the i think it's the uh, three c's the like country cover club uh, offer it gun plan is one that i'm personally with that is a it's just a, a brilliant package there i think there does need to be more added to it and i will at some point actually when i've got time to speak to them i'm looking at actually approaching a number of different insurers to maybe bolster up the protection that they uh, that they offer even if you have to pay more for it i mean the gun plan insurance is something like 20 or 30 pound a year i would not even blink at spending double or triple that a year if a few other things were included like legal assistance for voluntary uh, surrender which currently no one really covers so yeah this is not heading in a very good direction if the police can can quote public interest immunity then we're we're all pretty much screwed they don't necessarily have to come up with the goods they can you know it allows them really to play around with reasoning and justification and and even to some extent evidence gives gives them the the go it gives them the uh, the green pass to keep away your certificates and yourself with absolutely no chance at all of you know, defending it and you know what is just absolutely sickening at all if you already you know if you if you haven't been following it or you need a refresher this all started last august with the the plymouth shooting where devon and cornwall firearms licensing gave somebody a certificate that had had multiple accusations and investigations and arrests for assault that was receiving anger management classes that had his own parents phoning his doctors phoning the nhs phoning the police pleading with them to take away this guy's guns they were adamant that something bad was going to happen this is the same force that took away this person's gun guns and certificate and ended up giving him back those certificates while all of this was going on and a month later he goes and kills a number of people you know the amount of mistakes that were made by that department are, are literally too too many to count on both hands there are you know and that so that's bad enough then they decide to trigger this just avalanche of gun seizures seizures turning up to people's houses at all time of the night basically strong arming them effectively misleading them saying you know make giving the impression that they are revoking the certificates when all they were doing was asking for them to voluntary to voluntarily surrender the language they were using was was very firm very direct and again very sort of misleading and it triggered this across the whole, whole whole of the country this wasn't just happening in devon and cornwall we saw this up and down the country so they triggered these pretty much needless um, seizures voluntary s surrenders revocations what whatever circumstance they were they were done under that was i think sort of as bad as people could think it could get well hang on a minute you've made a load of mistakes as a department and now you're coming after the legal gun owners because of that like get your own house in order first to add to that they're now trying to set precedent to give the police and firearms licensing carte blanche to remove anybody's certificates whenever they want without even having to come up with a reason like if if this goes through and this becomes a tool used by firearms licensing the death nail of this sport 
Nobody will ever be able to defend a revocation again. Nobody will ever be able to defend a refusal for a certificate again. And they will see it as open season on firearms owners within the UK. They will go ham because there will be no consequence. There is very little consequence for firearms licensing at the moment if they don't provide the level of service that they should, that when they make mistakes, nobody can really hold them to account. We've seen that, again, with this specific case, Andrew went to his, his effective Independence Police uh, Complaints Commission and they said, yeah, we don't get involved in firearms license. Well, hang on a minute. Well, if, if you're the guys that sort of monitor the police and keep the police in check and you're not going to get yourself involved in firearms licensing, well, who the hell am I meant to go to, right? It's like, like why is firearms licensing, it is part of the police, right? So why can't you go to an independent police complaints commission to complain about firearms licensing within the police? This is why, as per last the last week's live stream, something big needs to change, and it and it needs to, I think, change very quickly. We need to see accountability within firearms licensing, either with an independent body that is actually going to hold them to account, that is actually going to stop these, for lack of better words, <laughs> uh, shenanigans, uh, and actually go. No, no, hang on a minute. You've, you're destroying this person's life and you haven't even given him a reason? That, no, no, sorry, that's not, that's not good enough. What could, in, in, in any sense, compromise national security if about a single person with their firearms case? Right, if the guy's a terrorist, lock him up. If he's been, you know, searching how to make certain things online, lock him up. Like either somebody is so dangerous that the security services have so much on them that they can't divulge, or 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 you're just literally making it up. Uh, and that's the other thing. The main reason for for PPI, PPI, PII, is because of you know protecting the identity. Usually, it's for protecting the identity of agents, which of course is very important. You know, usually. Um, you know, uh, you have to give, uh, as a witness, you have to give, you know, testimony and this, that and the other. Well, if you are an active security agent, then you know, don't exactly want your face and name plastered uh, everywhere. You may still be on active uh, operations. The other thing is the techniques that they use to investigate the you know security services they they don't they, you know i'm sure i'm teaching you guys to suck eggs here but they don't necessarily use conventional or or current police investigation techniques you know the the, the security services are at the cutting edge of you know obtaining information obtaining evidence and um you know and effectively reconnaissance on these you know, on criminals and terrorists and this, that, and the other. They don't want the methods that they are using to be publicly aired. So I can understand the reason for public interest immunity. It does protect the methods that are used and the people that are going out and ultimately keeping us safe from some very bad people. But why is that now being used against a, you know, sort of your average, average firearms owner? It just seems a completely disproportional reaction, and again, I think ultimately, it, it it well, it could be a question of is it hiding something bigger? And you know, if if the public interest immunity is upheld, we will never know. If it if it is not upheld and they aren't able to use this public interest immunity or PII, I would imagine or predict that the case is going to get dropped very, very quickly. Again, this is it's it's one, it's another tool for the police, it's another sort of weapon in their arsenal that they can bring these cases against somebody, try and get it as far as possible. And when it seems like something is going to be exposed, when it seems like they're going to end up with egg on their face, they can literally just walk away. They can go. Actually, we're we're dropping we're dropping charges. Actually, we're going to give you your certificates. We're not going to go to court anymore. And you're like, well, but what about the last eighteen months that you've literally ruined my life? Yeah. yeah um, well, sorry about that. You know. And if they're not able to use this PII, which I hope is the ultimate uh, outcome, 
for this case. Uh, my prediction would be that they drop it very, very quickly because either what they are trying to use is you know, potentially very dodgy or they, again, absolutely have nothing on this guy and they're effectively just chancing their, uh, their arm. Um, so, so yeah, fun and games being a UK firearms owners. Uh, if you if you are watching and you're enjoying, again a quick reminder: hit that like button. It really does make a make a difference. We got uh, what 150, 160 people watching and like 66 likes. So if if you're watching and not liking, why are you watching? Um, so if you're watching, you should be liking. So let's um, let's have a. Um, let's have a quick look at what you guys have been saying. Oh yes, um, D Doherty. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. You want to talk? You want to add to the list of the um, <laughs> cockups of of Devon and Cornwall firearms licensing. This was a, a very interesting case, which again I think we covered on the uh, on the channel. In, in terms of a firearm, you know, the, when you want to review or maybe score. <laughs> Devon and Firearms license of uh, Devon and Cornwall Firearms licensing, they don't seem to really like following the procedure or following the rules. It's, it's again like, guys, look in the mirror. Like the problem isn't with the lawful firearms owners; it's with you not being able to do your jobs. Um, so this was an article, and yes, this um, you're very right, um, D Dirty. This has gone very very quiet. Um, locals in turmoil over controversial police firing range plans uh, so this is just like absolutely laughable uh, local residents living close to a disused quarry used by Devon and Cornwall police as a firing range claim their lives will be ruined if permission is granted for the force to not only continue using the site but increase the amount of days it uses it it came to light after a frustrated mum confronted officers after being able to walk easy, to easily walk into the firing range during live weapons training. Mid Devon District Council received a planning application from the police force via its online planning portal on March 29th. However, it was deemed by the council as being invalid. An application for the retention of the disused quarry as two firing Rangers was validated on the on May twentieth. The fourth the force is seeking is also seeking to extend the use of the site from what is is to believe around thirty days a year to, to up to one hundred and forty one days a year. The land has been used by Devon and Cornwall police training for more than forty years, and during uh, that time, it has required updated planning consent from Mid Devon District Council. The last obtained planning permission expired in 2014. So, so, so not only does the the firearms licensing team like to not follow the rules, follow the procedures, and effectively hand a mass murderer the weapons to go and kill a number of people. The firearms officers and police in general really don't like see like seem to want to follow rules and procedure. Devon and Cornwall police use the firing range without planning permission for seven years. Could could you imagine? Could you imagine for one second if a lawful firearms owner put in to the council for planning permission to use a shooting range was denied? or their planning permission expired, but yet they continued to use it. You would have armed police, you'd have helicopters, you would have the whole brigade there shutting you down within a matter of hours. But yet the armed police get to do what they like. It, again, it just seems continuously like there is no count accountability and that when it comes to firearms, either firearms licensing or actual police firearms units, they pretty much got carte blanche because who are you going to complain to? So yeah, thank you for for reminding me on on that one. Um, I did see a quick question, uh, Major Jim. I know a few people uh, sort of cleared it up, but just as a as a quick point to to sort of tell the rest of the stream. So you know, within the UK, when you have a firearms certificate or a shotgun certificate, that permits you to be in possession of the firearms or, or shotguns on those certificates or purchase ones which you again have lawful authority from those certificates to go and purchase 
it, it's not unusual that you share a house with somebody and if you want that person to also have access to the to your guns they also need to have their own certificates this is actually really common and it's it's really not hard to do as long as both of you can you know meet the suitability bar and both of you can successfully obtain a firearm and or shotgun certificate then applying for all of the guns that both of you have is is really not an issue there, there are a number of couples that i know of that that do this and it just makes things a little bit easier so if uh, certainly with a shotgun certificate it's really really easy because with a shotgun certificate you are allowed to buy as, as many shotguns uh, as you want you don't have the same slots as you do on a firearm certificate so if you've already got a shotgun certificate and your partner has a shotgun certificate and she's already got guns and you've already got guns the easiest thing to do is to write all of the guns like duplicate the certificates basically write all of the guns on both of your certificates then you can store them all in the same safe and then you can both have access to them you you both have lawful uh, authority to possess with firearm certificate it's pretty much exactly the same it is a little trickier because you need the specific slots and unfortunately good reason when it comes down to good reason for these slots just saying oh so my my missus can have uh, access to my guns as well that wouldn't be good enough reason she would have to be doing the same amount of, you know, the same shooting that you are and have the same good reason through sport shooting or hunting to have those slots on the firearm certificate but if 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 they've already got a a certificate if you're already looking to combine guns they you're both probably avid shooters you're both probably going to the range together and both probably doing the same activities so that probably won't be um, as big an issue but yeah duplicate certificates are, are pretty uh, common and it does make things a hell of a lot uh, simpler in the long run otherwise you end up with duplicate safes something obviously to be aware of and to not fall foul of is that if one of you has you know if you both have shotgun certificates but one of you has a firearm certificate then the other person is not going to be able to have access to those firearms so whilst you'd both have access will be lawfully uh, be able to have access to all of the shotguns the firearms would still be still needed to be kept separate so yeah don't don't combine everything you have to make sure that both of you has have lawful authority to possess all of the guns that you are going to keep in a shared safe uh, but yeah any more questions on that then use the the chat section again always say with these live streams if there are any questions you have that you just want clarifying or any topics you want to bring up to discuss there is a chat box you can get involved you can have you know, have your opinions heard raise questions raise uh, raise topics and of course if you're not watching this live then you can use the comment section as well i do try to monitor comments on the channel as as best as possible so any questions down the line use that comment section as well and of course don't forget to like and subscribe um good to see that paul is uh uh liked liked the intro do you, do you want to see it again do you want to see it again i think i need to give a little bit of context for maybe anybody that hasn't hasn't seen it in the past and and plus i just love watching it because it's it's hilarious um so <laughs> as i'm sure some of you are aware but maybe not all of you paul and paul and i went out to um represent great britain at the pan american handgun championships oh that's it there's the video was, i knew there was something else i was meant to write down um the video went for went live uh last uh, last night um so you can go and check that out on the channel it's the full uh 24 stages it was uh six stages a day over four days um and we both went out there um let's i'll, I'll give you a, a little sneak peek of the of the video first let's bring that up um as i'll just skip to the shooting uh you just want to see the shooting so yeah you can see all of the stages this is a mixture of both myself paul um and also richard so richard and myself were on the production team uh paul was on the standards team but we were all in squad at 21 it was an absolutely fantastic uh competition overall uh so yeah there's there's richard there there's me look at those little legs go um, yeah, maybe need to trim down that ton. Uh, but yeah, 24 stages, it really was, you know, 
I think my favourite one. Let's find my favourite stage. Stage. It's going to be around here somewhere. Is it before then? This is stage nine. This was a real rapid stage. Um, okay, no, it's not that one. No, it's not that one. This one. So you had to hold on to this uh, this tie, run down. It dropped those um, those platforms, allowed you to go ahead uh, and cheat it. So that that was sort of my favorite. I think overall my favorite stage of the competition. And for just rapid targets, it, this one really did flow and, and felt and felt good. Yeah. But if you want to see the whole of it, um, of course, who says the British can't shoot handguns? We actually have some really talented handgun shooters here within the UK. But go and check out the um, the video if if you want. But a little side story, if you weren't already aware. Paul's just going, why do you have to bring this up every single time? Because it's, it's, I feel for you, Paul. I really do. I like, honestly, hand on heart, I would feel as traumatic as you did. Still doesn't stop it from being a little bit funny. Um, so what, what ended up happening was uh, within IPSC, you have major and minor power factors, basically down to the um, you know, the speed and weight of the bullet, obviously the, the faster it is, the heavier the bullet, the more recoil, therefore the slower you can shoot it accurately. So they give you more points. Paul was shooting in, thought he was shooting in, uh, in minor, uh, oh, sorry, in, in major, uh, ended up getting his gun chronoed and it didn't meet power factor. So they bumped him down to minor and you know, that, that, that would be bad enough, but now at competitions, ROs, are ripping into him. I think I'm going to chrono your ammo. I was oh, I'm hammer. Oh, hammer. Oh, hammer. And then... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Emotional damage! That will not be the last time that's shown, I can I can assure you, Paul. Whenever you chirp up in the, in the chat, boom, that is now saved into o OBS. You just get a little bit too big for your boots, bang! Major minor power factor joke. Um... <laughs> So yeah, that that's the little explanation uh, behind uh, that intro. So yeah, sorry, sorry, Paul. Uh, <laughs> like, don't don't feel too bad for him. He takes any opportunity to take the piss out of me that he can. Um, so what have you guys? Uh, shouldn't there be an IPCC for Devon and Cornwall from every shooting uh, from every shooting organisation? Is this is plain misconduct? Uh, complaint IPCC complaint yes there should be but the the IPCC or the equivalent IP, IPCC of Devon and Cornwall are not interested in firearms licensing so you can write as many complaints as you want it's not going to do anything uh, yeah another organization that's good if you've got a shotgun or coterminous certificate is the CPSA uh, again the, the membership is a little bit more I think it's about 70 or 80 pounds a year which again, I'm more than happy to pay for legal expenses insurance. But if you're specifically wanting legal expenses insurance, you can go and check out uh, Gun Plan. That that is who I would ultimately um, recommend. Avoid having to self fund your own potential legal f legal fees with Gun Plan. Um, you paid by them or something, Paul? <laughs> Paul, stop it. Yes, yes, we know I got dropped from major to minor at the Pan Ams. Not everyone, I'm sure. I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's not everyone out there. Um, <laughs> so it's 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 not going to get old, as we said when we came back. It's got legs. Uh, Warzone streamer, hello Callum. Um, how would I buy a quieter shotgun as a person with a certificate when I hopefully get one, but I'm under the age of eighteen. Um, Warzone streamer, I did see your your comments on the other video. Uh, I did, I have done a video in the past about age limits, but this is a topic that does come up quite a lot, and I'm actually planning on doing a specific video uh, on it. So I did see your comments, and I think it's just best to to do a separate video on it. But I will sort of cover it now. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the table. Like this is why it's hard to do it off the fly because there's so many different age gaps. But basically you can obtain or i.e. be given a gun f f under the age of 18 i can't remember i think it's i think it's something like 
12 for a shotgun, maybe 14 for a shotgun. I know that firearms, it's older than the shotgun. But anyway, basically, depending on how young slash old you are, you can be given, even if you're under the age of 18, you can be given a gun uh, and you can, of course, obtain your, your own certificates. So basically, and this is where it gets really tricky if you don't have somebody that with already with certificates. So a gun shop technically could give you a gun but obviously they're a gun shop they're there to um to to make money so what you really need is a is somebody else over the age of 18 that also has certificates because like whilst technically the person that is over the age of 18 if they didn't have certificates well it's getting signed straight on the the like you know the person that's over the age of 18 say without certificates can give the gun shop the money but then that give it straight to you and but like you lawfully can't buy a gun without a certificate so it, it gets very gray and murky and, and muddy and basically the best way is to find um let's say specifically with a shotgun because that's a hell of a lot easier you find somebody with a shotgun certificate over the age of 18 that is is willing to buy the gun for you and then give it to you so they can go to the gun shop they can or, or go to you know go on gun trade or whatever they can then go and buy that gun and then they can give it to you and sign it onto your uh, certificate. So, you know, that that is certainly one way. Firearms gets a little bit trickier because obviously you have those slots. They're effectively going to have to fill up a slot on their certificate. They're then going to have to transfer it onto you. And then they're going to have to do a one-for-one -one variation. But it's, it's still sort of the same process. There's just a little bit more uh, admin involved. So, yeah, there. I am aware. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to... I'm not going to name names. I am aware of a few gun shops that will, as long as there is a parent there, whether or not they are over the age of 18, will accept the money from a, a parent. Sorry, whether or not they have a certificate, um, will accept the money from the parents and then give um, give the gun to um, give the gun to the person. Now, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's up to the RFD to 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 pull that. Um, I'm going to say personally, it's not something that I would be comfortable uh, in doing because the the paper trail is going to show it going directly from um, from the uh, from the gun shop to that uh, under eighteen certificate, and then if the police want to go, well, hang on a minute, how did he buy it? And you go, oh, I gave it to him. Right. Uh, let's have a look at your books. Or oh, where is this cash come? come from or where's this transaction come from oh yeah that was actually their parents so technically the parents bought it without a certificate it's very great but really the best way you know, hopefully either your your mum or your dad or maybe another relative who's over the age of 18 already has a shotgun certificate and can gift it to you but yeah the 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 specific ages and again i i do want to caveat it and go that this isn't something that i've specifically looked into on the law so that's my understanding of it at the moment uh, but why I think it's it's worth a video because this is a question that comes up quite a lot but it's something that if I'm sort of going to give out advice I need to make sure to the to the best of my knowledge that it is correct so uh, but I believe that is the process at the end of the day there are a number of people under the age of 18 with guns on their certificates it is possible but finding maybe the most efficient and certainly the a lawful way of doing it uh, is is the most important thing uh, but yeah i hope that helps but basically you need to find somebody over the age of 18 that is is gonna they're gonna buy the gun uh, with a certificate they're gonna buy the gun and then give it to you does bisley nra do the legal expenses with their membership yes they do but i wouldn't advise trusting or relying on them because of course when they found out i lost my certificates instead of you know oh do you know we've uh, we've got legal expense insurance for that nope they just revoked my membership so yeah you know if they if they sort of don't like you or they sort of want you to lose your certificates then they just revoke your membership and then you won't be able to invoke the uh, the legal expenses insurance uh, i personally wouldn't go near the nra for any help or assistance in defending your own certificates and that's coming from personal experience. I'm not like I'm salty or anything. <laughs> the better shooter, the better shooter is you, Paul. 
I would say minorly. Um. <laughs> Uh, Michael Musgrave, they do not need planning permission if uh, if they only use it for 28 days a year. Like, of course, absolutely. But this is something that they, you know, they, they want to use it a hell of a lot more than that. Um, the thing is, gee, can you get away with doing that? Well, the the fact that they have to it's, it says in the article that they have they have been having to renew it every year that it would it would say that there is you know something else sort of going on there, um, and they are still in they are still in breach of it. You know that's the way the article certainly plays it out. Uh, crazy, crazy. I was talking to a farm worker the. Um, last weekend about shooting and licensing he told me there is a policeman from Wiltshire that had broken the law and in resulting this he lost his, his FAC and SGC good like if you go out there and you break the law like you know one of the whole things about being a fit and proper person is that you're going to abide by the law if you go around breaking other laws how can you then say that you can be trusted not to break the laws uh, with the guns under your uh, certificate Uh, Colin Armstrong, that is not quite correct. On an FAC, you can have a condition on your license. The hold of, holder of this certificate may also have in his possession any firearm, cell moderator, and ammunition listed on X. Brilliant. Okay. So again, it's um, it's it is more of a common thing. Certainly, if they have that in in their case, so you know they can pretty much write whatever conditions they want on the certificate. So. You know, you can have access to the guns, but it doesn't necessarily give you lawful authority to go out and use them. Um, so, yeah, it's well, that's great if they actually get the. Um, that makes things a hell of a lot easier. Any guidance on filling out the lead ban consultation? Yes, that is again something that I am currently working on. Uh, now that the competition season is is. Uh, it's, it's, we've got one more competition left next next month um, and that is a level three action air up in Carlisle if you want to give action air a go if you've got a short gun competition license either action air or or full bore um, within IPSC under the UK PSA and you want to go and give action air a try there's a level three up in uh, up in Carlisle you can if if you need any more information it's on shoot and score it you should be able to find it but if you want any details you can you can drop me a message you can email english shooting at gmail.com or get in contact with us through magload and and we can point you in the right direction or paul if you could put the link in the chat that would be really really handy uh so yeah looking forward to that but yeah we've i, I seriously i've done more competitions this year than i think every other year combined and with you know certainly doing the uh, let's say the more say more serious sort of national comps and filming them as well and connors are rowing them it's not just a day thing anymore it really is a whole weekend which has severely eaten into my editing and filming time uh, which is why it's been harder to keep you know the the live streams have suffered for because of it because you know sometimes we head up even earlier obviously been out to the US I know I know I can hear those small violins um, it's been a it's been a really hectic year for for competition which um you know I'm not I'm not complaining but now that the competition season is finally coming uh, down the the evenings are getting longer and dark uh, getting shorter and darker and um, darker quicker um i'll be at home doing a lot more editing and a lot more filming so during the sort of the autumn during the the winter there should be a hell of a lot more content and i'm finally getting through um fin finally making a start on getting through all of the match footage uh, that I've taken throughout the year. There's seriously a hell of a lot of matches. Um, obviously, we've just had the Welsh Mini Rifle Championships, which we will be talking about in a second. Um, there's what other videos haven't I put out? There's the Yveley uh, Mini Rifle Championships. There's the Basildon Yveley um, Basildon Mini Rifle Championships, although I tend to try and forget about those. Uh, there's um, Recall Scotland's first level three. Scottish Championships, there's the Coats of Iron, level three match, there 
was the Welsh shotgun match. So I think there's like at least six. Also, there's the match that we went out and filmed in Denmark, which was I think level three, level four rifle match. Really, really interesting. Like you, you will see some of the best shooters in the world in that video. Um, re like at, like legitimate world champions um, doing their thing and seriously watching those guys shoot in person is is absolutely incredible so yeah there's going to be loads of uh match videos plus i want to get back into um obviously the law videos and things like that and current affairs i know that i know the stream sort of covers that a, a lot more but uh, and, and and other people have requested actually to redo a lot of the old uh law videos which i've been toying with doing for for a very long time now so we um i might as well finally get around to it um, but yes uh, this weekend was uh, oh no actually another little bit of of news i like i like bringing this this up whenever there's a big no news story and i'm sure long-term viewers and subscribers of the channel will um will understand why i just want to you know put it out there you never want me you never want to be in a position where i said i told you so Paul will, att will attest, 100%. Uh, I'm just going to check when the first video was. Um, so I think the first video I ever did on 3D printing firearms. <laughs> and everyone's going, oh, not this again. Uh, let me find it here. Is this, is this the one? Um, Tube Buddy is making things rather difficult to... Sort of in the way there. Is this the first one? Maybe it was even earlier. Oh no, that is about... Sh so I think the, fir the first video ever on the channel about 3D printing, which is not what I'm specifically talking about now, Uh, that was in August 2016. I started talking about 3D printing and uh, within the firearms industry. But the first video that I ended up talking about potential dangers and how we're going to see the the landscape of firearms potentially change was back in 2019. Now, the reason I like bringing this up is because back then I was laughed at. So many people laughed at me uh, for um, and I think that I'm, I'm positive there were earlier videos than that so many people were like what the hell are you talking about they are never going to feasibly be able to 3d print a gun that is uh, that can be used and and yet every other month now we seem to see articles of 3d printers being used in you know by crime and 3d printed gun factories turning up um, and this is just the latest one met police sees large number of 3d printed firearms components in north london raid metropolitan police officers have seed seized a collection of 3d printed firearm components in a raid on the north london property today you know they're they're printing lowers right <laughs> it's you know and everyone goes oh you can't 3d print a barrel yes you can oh you need some metal components yeah, the easy bits to get hold of. The maybe unlicensed parts you can get hold of. Police have discovered a suspect 3D printed firearms operation, uh, suspected 3D printed firearms operation in London. The Met announced today officers with the Specialist Crime Command have recovered a large number of firearm components. The seizure was one of the largest um, seizures of 3D printed firearms components ever in the UK. So it's it's growing, right? It, it's this isn't a problem that's you know curtailing or well not curtailing it's not pl plateauing it's growing this is this is only happening more and more um officers also recovered ammunition as one picture showed a pack of 50 bullets it's not bullets it's ammunition it's bullets are just the heads now i can't recognize it my i might be completely wrong with this but I'm adamant that that those are probably blanks. 
I don't know if anybody can recognise the box. Are, is are they actually live rounds of ammunition or are they blanks? Because this was one of the things again. What loads of people say? Oh well, it's all well and good printing a gun. What are you going to do with the ammunition? Well, hello, like that's that's ammunition right there, right? They've got ammunition or they're using blanks. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but you can turn blanks into a viable um, viable ammunition. Uh, this highlights how the emerging threat of 3D printed uh, 3D firearms continues to evolve. Firearms are subject to strict regulation in the UK and are only reserved for those with a license. Uh, people can only receive one of the following. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, you yeah, know, all, all of that. Like, we're seeing factories now in the UK of people turning them, larger numbers. You know, it, and, and the thing is, it just, it's on one issue where, you know, firearms licensing and the police are spending so much money time and effort on coming after the lawful firearms owners meanwhile you know 3d printer go burr like it's they're just churning them out it's like you, you, you fart in the wrong direction and you're going to get your licenses taken away and you're even not going to be able to be told why your license is taken away but the criminals the real danger pe dangerous people out there who have absolutely no concern for the law are just churning them out like sweets right it's just like maybe maybe like have a look at the real issue here maybe like switch the focus from a lawful gun owner that you know had an argument with their ex-wife 10 years ago and look at the real issue you know of of criminals 3d printing cheap disposable untraceable firearms right <laughs> you know it's like you know Deer stalker that has never had any issues with the police. Criminal 3D printing firearms. Which should we send the resources to? Oh, I know. The man on the quad bike. Like, so yes, 3, 3D printing guns is is an issue. It is going to, like, I'm, I'm waiting for it. Like, I'm not, I'm not, like, gladly waiting for it. And it's not exactly something that I'm going to be pleased when it happens. The first 3D printed firearm murder in the UK. It, it's 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 going to happen. You know, criminals. You know, the amount of of criminal viable guns that are going to start being um, found in in the possession of criminals. That number is only going to increase, right? And the thing is, there isn't in it that like, what can they do? Right, you know, yes, boatloads of guns are, are smuggled in, and this, that, and the other, but they are—they're harder to—they are harder to get into the country. They've still got to smuggle them into the country. You know, you've got to be in possession of it. It costs a lot more money because of the work that has gone in to getting it into a criminal's hands. Here, if somebody goes right, I'm going to go and commit an armed robbery. Oh, you know, I'm, I need to transport these got these drugs, and I need um, some protection. Right. I'm going to sit here and print a gun are, you know, so yeah, there's the danger area of while they're printing it, they could be caught. And obviously while they're in possession for of it, but they can literally print a gun, have it on them for the purpose that they need, then dispose of it and not think twice. Like you're, you're talking like 10, 20 quids worth of plastic and material, right? The criminal can do that time and time again, which means when they're not up to no good, they they don't have any guns on them. They're not they they can't be linked to anything. They've just got a three D printer sat there. You know, you can't just go around arresting people for three D printers. Otherwise, magloads a bit screwed. Five years for every three D printer found in the factory. Oh shit! Uh, <laughs> it's like you'd never see us again. Um, actually, how many printers do we have? Yeah, a lot, like 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 a lifetime's worth. Um, yeah, so I I honestly don't know what the answer is. Like, we already have guns. We, we already have laws like you know, not shooting and killing people is bad. We already have laws where you can't be in possession of these guns. Like, how do you stop these people from three D printing all of these these guns, right? So so easily and cheaply and and disposably. Like, it's it's only an issue that is going to grow. Maybe that's why Andrew hasn't got his certificates. Maybe he's got he's got a he's got too many three D printers. They're a bit like, oh, he looks dodgy. He's got a quad bike and he's got three D printers. Must be up to no good. Uh, he Heppy, pretty sure they are Yas Gold nine millimeter blanks. 
they seized a Rite blank fire with them. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. So there you go. I that was a gut feel. Let me let me enhance. Um, we say they are yes gold nine millimeter blanks. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That that is the the same. So here we go. There's a website um, for sale. So this is that's the box there of them, and these are are blank, not live rounds. And that yeah, you can see the five. You can see the gold. That that is the the ammunition. So again, all of the people out there saying doesn't matter if you 3d print a gun you don't have the ammunition you can literally buy this off off the website you know off, off a website delivered to your door right again i'm not going to get into how in the in you know how it can be done but it is scarily easy how you can convert this into potential or well, lethal ammunition right and and that lethal ammunition as we've discussed so many times is the real crux of firearms law in the in the uk because a firearm is def is defined as something with a lethal barrel is a lethal barreled weapon it is something that emits a projectile that could be lethal and you know a lethal barreled weapon you know it doesn't need to be fancy it doesn't need to be reusable it doesn't need to be particularly powerful it, it is something that could potentially kill you know there are some air guns that could can kill right you don't need a lot of power and you don't need a lot of accuracy you know a lot of these crimes it's not like you know these criminals are taking a hundred five hundred a thousand yard shots at each other right it's up close and personal stuff you know you i'm sure you've all seen the videos of you know these 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 hits like look look at the the case more recently of of the little girl that that literally like just got caught in in the crossfire between two thugs right that that was within that was within the confines of like someone's like front porch right that was through the doors at the stairs it's the, that's a five ten yard shot you really do not need something that accurate or that powerful to be able to kill somebody at those distances and 3d printers a 3d printed barrel offers more than enough um you know st strength uh, in the structure to be able to withstand um a, a lethal projectile or or the the you know the the forces and pressures of what would be a lethal projectile or a lethal round you know and and i've been saying this literally been saying this for years and everyone just goes oh it's not an issue it's like you know, it gets to the point. It's like, well, why, why do we even have firearms licenses? Why do we have firearms laws when you can just literally replicate a gun? It's just it makes everything sort of null and void. Um, and and it's a massive potential tool for for the criminals out there. You know, and 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 the fire. You know, the the technology is only getting better. The files that you can easily go out and get online are only getting better as well. The instructions to do so, like, it's like people are pretty inventive. Um, on a slightly more, say, humorous note, on 3D printed guns and being a little bit inventive, um, like, some guy just... I, I can't remember if we talked about this on the, on the live stream previously, but this guy just is, is just winning right <laughs> there's and this is uh all the all completely lawful why is my phone buzzing what what is um ah it's paul um <laughs> saying he's he's messaging things that can't be put out on stream unfortunately <coughs> no it's not dick pics i'd put those out on stream i don't care um, uh, yeah, so uh, a guy that's thought you'd get a little bit, um, um, yeah, a little bit of his own back, or take advantage of a guy by back, and I love the fact that this is on the Guardian because the the journalist probably had a mini seizure writing it. Um, 
New York changes gun buyback after seller gets $21,000 for 3D printed parts. Like, bravo. Like, he saw an opportunity and he went for it. A, a participant used a 3D printer to make firearms parts in bulk that he could then exchange for gift cards. Now, bearing in mind, like, this works in the US because you can make your own guns, right? And in the US, the lower, as it is here, well, over here, the lower is, is a component part. It's a restricted, licensable part. But, uh, but over there, like, that is the gun. The lower is the gun. So I believe, and I've heard of this story before, like, I'm pretty sure he just sat there printing lowers. Uh, the Attorney General of New York has changed the rules of state gun buyback program after a participant exploited the system by using a 3D printer to make firearm parts in bulk that he could then exchange for $21,000 in gift cards. Um, the seller, who identified himself by a pseudonym, said he travelled from West Virginia to a, guy, a gun buyback on the 20, uh, 27th uh, of August in New York to take advantage of a loophole in the programme and to demonstrate that buybacks are futile in the era of printable weapons. At the buyback, the seller turned in... <laughs> oh, wow. It wasn't even... It wasn't even... Um, lowers at the buyback the seller turned in 60 printed auto sears small devices that can convert firearms into fully automatic weapons under the rules of the buyback uh, hosted by the office of the attorney general uh, Le um, latita james and city police that entitled him to 350 for each of the printed parts including a hundred dollar premium since they were deemed to be ghost guns lacking serial numbers Oh, wow. The seller who declined to provide his real name said in an email on Monday the prospect of making money was enticing, but that the bigger reason he took part in the buyback was to send a message. He calls the idea of buybacks ridiculously stupid, adding that the people running this event are horribly uneducated about guns, gun crime, and the law surrounding the regulation of guns. James's office said it responded to... Hello. Who was Oh, we 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 have an in, we have an intruder. This is this is also Holly's office as as well, or or music room, um, and she's grossly unprepared and has to come in and, and interrupt my live stream to get stuff that she probably. <laughs> well, you failed. I'll see you in a bit. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Where was I until I was so rudely interrupted? Um, the loophole. Oh, you didn't see any of that because you were looking at, you were you were looking you you were reading the text. So actually, she could have just been quiet and you wouldn't have known. And I just made a far bigger deal of it than than it needed to be. Anyway, back back to the back to this absolute legend. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it responded to the gun loophole by giving buyback personnel more discretion to determine the value of weapon being handed in, and. Um, and setting a standard that all 3D printed guns accepted by the program must be capable of being fired more than once. Um, just like, you know, because because the thing is, like a criminal, you know, I, I, like how many, we've seen this in the, we, we've covered buybacks in the UK, right? Does, is it actually the criminals handing in guns? It's, it's the law abiding people that have probably found something up in the attic or it's people that are giving up their certificates and, you know, they don't want it anymore. But this guy, you know, it's not like overall, I don't think buybacks and, and amnesties and all that actually prevent crime. It's I, I think it's just a little bit of, of lip surface service. It's a little bit of virtue signaling seem to be doing something right. Twenty one thousand dollars. You think what that could be used for, you know, in terms of policing or crime prevention, you know, and you know, yeah, you could look at it one way that this guy has has now taken away from the city, he's taken away money, but no, he's made the point, right? You're more than willing to give twenty one thousand dollars for a load of hooks, three D printed hooks that probably cost him a fraction of a penny each to make, but you know, you you don't want to actually go out there and and, and fight the real crime. So yeah, maybe a slightly slightly better. Um, maybe a slightly more warmer tone to round 3D printed guns. Uh, like we we did 
actually consider doing this. Uh, so with the offensive weapons bill, there was uh, within there was loads of stuff, not just Mars and Lever release. You could also hand in uh, blowpipes, right? And and here's the thing: depending depending, I think on the the length, the size, or the power of a blowpipe, it is actually a section one or even section five weapon. Right, yeah, that's right. Even a blowpipe restricted here in the UK, uh, or blow darts, not necessarily a blowpipe. It's like if you have blow darts for them, whatever. But there was an amnesty, well, not an amnesty. There was compensation for handing in blowpipes. Well, what is a blowpipe? It's a bit of pipe. So you know, there was a number of people who I I know that were considering chopping up bits of you know cheap ass like PVC pipe going into a police station and going, I'll have a tenner each for these, please. You know, it's it's sort of the same point, it's the same message. Again, has has the um, the millions of pounds that have been spent on buying back Mars and leave release and all the other things that were handed in, you know, is that going to prevent crime? I, you know, you can never be 100% certain, but I am 99999999 and recurring percent certain that that money is just utterly wasted when it comes to actually preventing crime and it would have been in some way nice to just hone that message a l little bit more but of course you know, it could be seen to be anti-police or you know anti or, you know, or pro crime and all of that and again like as a firearms owner as a, as a certificate holder you know you can you imagine like if, if the americans had licenses they would be looking to revoke his they would find some way to frame it as fraud and go and take away his licenses. So yeah, I'm not aware that anybody actually went and cut up bits of pipes and handed them in. Uh, I am aware of a lot of people though that were buying really cheap like Amazon special uh, scopes and optics and were getting 150, 200 quid a pop for within the uh, offensive weapons bill. I think it was if you had, um, that's right, that's what they did is they, um, I think you had to be handing in a gun for the accessories, but they like produced five different Amazon special scopes and they were like, I only use these scopes with my rifle. You know, and these scopes cost them 20, 30 quid a pop and they're getting 150, 200 quid a pop for them. You know, that's an yeah, easy way to make a quick buck. Um, Chris Wilson. Does anybody have an idea of how long an FAC or SGC application takes in Lincolnshire? I own a farm and need it for pest control, and I am a member of a clay pigeon ground. Um, have applied, just waiting. Well, I might be able to help you because I have this handy basket table. Um, does it have? Here we go. So, for those of you who don't know, there's like the super duper basket league table. A review of firearms licensing departments in. England and Wales, uh, Lincolnshire, so, well, 61 days for uh, turnaround time renewal, turnaround time grant, average turnaround time. So you're looking at an average of 61 days in Lincolnshire. There you go. I hope I hope that gives you some sort of uh, an idea, sort of the best idea that you're going to get. Okay, here you go. Mad facts here on the English Shooting Channel. Uh, <laughs> Light in the mood, play the helicopter video. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Um, yeah, we. This is this is like YouTube gold, and I'm not really. You need to go and watch the full video. Um, we ended up. We were staying in an Airbnb for the um, Welsh Mini Rifle Championship, and a few of the people hadn't seen this video before this has absolutely nothing to do with with shooting or guns but i highly recommend going and, and watching this video let me go uh helicopter rescue spin it, you need to go and watch the full video for the full for effects like like seriously um it will not be the same watching it here uh, basically, I think it was a 74-year-old um, ends up getting rescued, like, and things things go wrong. So it's one of these videos that just gets worse and worse and worse. 
but also funnier and funnier, funnier. And you think, okay, she's she's going a little bit fast. Oh, I think they managed to stabilize her. She's going a little bit fast. She's going a little bit fast. Nothing. Let's go to the most replays. Yeah, you, you think you think that's fast? You think she's having a bad time? Yeah. <laughs> You're having a really bad day. Go and watch it. Just go and type in um, helicopter rescue spin. Yeah, again, nothing to do with shooting, but it's we we were in absolute tears. Um, and we decided in, in a bit of waiting, because, you know, practical shooting, there's a lot of um, waiting around. You know, you shoot for 30 seconds, but you wait for an hour. But it's the best 30 seconds ever. That's what she said. And, yeah, she, you know, you can... Um, yeah, you need to find time to, to, you know, find things to kill time. So we ended up pre a stage watching that video, which uh, got got everyone's moods quite high. Anyway, go and go and watch the video in full. Trust me, you'll be you'll be streaming. Um, talking, we keep talking about the Welsh Mini Rifle Championship. That was this weekend. As I said last year, it, like again, I don't want to necessarily belittle or, um, you know, uh, what's the word? I don't want to like be negative on any other competitions, right? I had fun at every single competition this year, be that mini rifle, shotgun, or, or whatever. That some high, like superbly run matches, high quality stages, fun stages, um, and I plan on doing every single uh, mini rifle match and every single shotgun match next year. I wouldn't attend them if I didn't enjoy them. Of course, like Basildon could have been a little bit more enjoyable, but that was completely my fault. And you know, Evely could have been a little bit more enjoyable, that was completely the gun's fault. So, uh, but nothing to do with the uh, with the organizers. But having said that, like the guys at Pro Shoot, the you know, the the guys that run and build the the Welsh Mini Rifle Championship and even I would say the the Welsh Shotgun Championship they just I think are beginning to really set the bar and it was a fantastic match to uh, to finish off on uh, and it you know it was all the stages like you know you do uh, when you've got to do 12 stages for for a level three you do in inadvertently every now and then end up with like filler stages you you end up with a couple of stages here and there that just are you know, it's sort of like, oh shit, we need to do one or one of the others. Like, you know, a couple of more here, here or there. Like every single stage just felt like, like they they weren't just doing this to f to fill a stage spot. Like they've done this, for, you know, for for a reason. They've thought about it and they've they planned it out and they've they've done it. It was an incredibly like diverse match as well it wasn't just all long long range stuff it wasn't just all close up blaggy it was a really good mixture stage to stage i think some really interesting stage designs as well uh, and i and i think it was a general over over overall test of of everybody it didn't seem to suit one person uh, or the other you know there's a lot of people that are let's say more gallery shooters that you know are able to just run to a position and very accurately reasonably fast you know, shoot all the targets that they can see. Um, then there's the shooters that are very good at movement, at very dynamic, explosive stages, and there was a good balance of both of those. So I think it's it was really good, good measure of the um, you know of the competitor uh, overall. And now these went out on the English shooting channel. Uh, these are the only sort of couple of stages that have been put out yet, but uh, I'll show you a couple of my. Well, so I wouldn't even say highlights there. I think there were some better stages there, but just you know, stages that I, I personally really, uh, really enjoyed and also did fairly well on, um, which helps. Uh, so this is just an absolute blag. Um, so for those of you that like, you know, a blag is is just like there's still a lot of skill involved, but it is just full throttle. Go as fast as you can. Um, like just you know it's a it's a blag you just you, you blag it um and it's uh it's it's the it's the one or it's the one and only i think i'm right in saying this the one and only stage at level three that i've ever won don't know what that says about m my shooting ability <laughs> like i'm just a blagger just yeah just go for it um so so yeah if you want to see how the stage was done 
this is how the stage should have been done. Admittedly, Ben did do it a lot quicker. Um, he just, I think he ended up picking a, a, a mic up. He did it about half a second quicker. Um, so you've got five targets. You've got two in here, one that side, one that side, and one in the center. My original plan was actually to take these two first, take the center one here, and then go right to left. However, doing it through the walkthrough, you never sort of seem to do it as, as quickly as when you you do it for real under the timer and basically what ended up happening is I took these targets and because of like the momentum I was already looking at this target before I could even think about shooting the center one so I ended up shooting it these two that one there and, and going round which ultimately I think was the the best way to do it it's not how I actually intended uh, but let, let's see um, it is a blink and you miss it stage And, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how it's done. Uh, it just goes downhill from here for the rest of my stages. Uh, but yeah, it, that was a really quick, quick, dirty, blaggy stage. And the next one, this is like the complete opposite. This is, was really, really trick, tricky because you've got all these different apertures. Unfortunately, you can't see all of the targets, but there's no shoots in this one. There's slightly further distances. I mean, you know, still maximum sort of 20 yards, but you've got one's five, five yards. So you're, you're having to ad ad uh, ad uh, adjust where you're shooting um, because you do have you know you have rise so and your po point of impact is going to be changing depending on the different um, the uh, the you know the different distances so you're trying to take this all in and calculate this sort of all on the fly um, but overall again went very well uh, normally this is a sort of stage that I I don't think I'd normally do very well at uh, ended up second overall. Um, on on the day but yeah really all about speed um, and you can see just uh, I'll go back in a minute some points about exactly why I've got the rifle set up in the way that I've got it set up, set up and I think really helped on this stage so you've got low apertures you've got high apertures uh, this aperture you couldn't actually see the majority of the target so you had to sort of go shoot it um, yeah, very, very dynamic stage, but also very technical, getting the gun in and out. And this is why um, I'm running this very compact setup. I am going to do a full video on this because I think this going forward is, is going to be my competition setup. Uh, buffer tube stock, right? Um, this, first, this first came about because of the way that I have the the gun set up and it, and it is from connor's sort of suggestion in doing this and i love it so if i actually if i go back you might be able to just about see that we have the optic that is the lowest mount that trigicon do so we have the the optic absolutely slammed down to the uh to the receiver or the, the upper receiver and that reduces your height over bore which means the deviation or you know the point of impact is minimized so the the downside is that if you've got particularly low cheekbones which uh, like i guess i have um it's actually if you have a stock on there and it raises your face up you can't get your eye directly straight on the dot so i wanted to remove the stock um obviously you still need a stock but that's why we've just gone for this buffer tube stock and so not only does it, it it works with this setup which i think ultimately a single dot for mini rifle i honestly think is the way to go you know we're, we're shooting a maximum of sort of 100 and 100 yards 120 yards you can accurately shoot those targets with a single dot as long as the dot is is crisp enough it's a 2 moa dot on the mro really i think this is the way forward for mini rifle it's it's a hell of a lot lighter and also less thinking because you can get that dot so low like you know yes that you have to think a little bit about hold over and hold hold under there is uh, still a little bit little bit of a shift but that's only really when you have reasonably tight no shoots like on every other target you put the dot on that target and you pull the trigger the bullet goes goes into the you know it, it pretty much always goes into the to the alpha um it's really down it is down to the shooter you know pulling shots and things things like that where, where you start missing but this is an incredibly like low think uh, setup. Um, the other benefit 
for for that stock is of course how compact and how light it makes the gun i'm not exactly the biggest chap out there right um you know i'm about five nine on a good day uh, with with little ippy, ippy itty legs and you can see that you know i'm right i'm right on the um the charge line there well not the charge line but like the you know the stage the boundaries you know somebody that's a little bit bigger is really going to struggle to to get down and get in there and also on a stage like this where you're coming in and out of those apertures which is where you're saving the amount of time like you can see as well like how easily i'm moving the gun how easy it is and quick it is to get in and out of those apertures and that's why i really like this setup it is light it is nimble it's agile it's compact so on on really challenging you know you know compact narrow stages like this when you're in and out of apertures it it really does you know reap reap rewards um so so yeah i i really think you know there was a lot of stages like that there was another one where you're going in and out of um basically you know tubes or tunnels and again it's getting the gun in and getting the gun out um there's definitely a few others where the stock oh yeah the my magnificent slide um which you will see in the full video or i might put the video out as a separate um you know just really awkward low down apertures tight uh you know there was a lot of you know, people where they were actually switching shoulders to get the guns round uh, the barricades well with the shorter stock you can actually just pivot the gun on your chest a lot easier um you know the, yeah the stage where it really really was a hell of a uh, an advantage to have a really small compact gun is you were basically in a uh, what do they call it um you're basically in a box and it's really quite a narrow condensed you had to really shuffle in to to get inside it and it was an option three, which means empty. You've got your mag there, your gun there, and you've got to load. You've got to load the gun. And there's a lot of people that first struggled to be able to load because you're, you know, you're using reasonably long magazines, more magazines in a minute. And you know, having that shorter stock, narrower, more compact gun allowed the magazine changes to be a lot easier. And also, because the targets were elevated, you had to shoot at an angle. Which again, if you've got a longer stock and a longer gun, it's harder to to get up. And so many people came away from that stage and said, "What an absolute pig!" And Paul and I are like, because Paul was, um, was was sort of using uh, the gun that I use for comp, so the gun set up for me, not necessarily for him. And we were like, "That was pretty straightforward." That stage actually, it was quite quite enjoyable. Uh, so yeah, lots. I think lots of advantages. You know, there was a toilet stage. Don't don't laugh. Genuine, actual, sat in a toilet. Um, and again, you you had apertures. And it's quite a narrow space that you're you're working in, and you have to pull the gun out of one aperture and go into another. So yeah, I I really think for mini rifle and certainly this match, certainly the Yeevely match, I'd say probably less so. Basildon Basildon becomes more accuracy, um, and I would say Carlisle is is probably as well. Uh, like mini rifle, you know, the general thing that I'm getting is that mini rifle is about speed, right? Yes, there is always a balance between speed and accurate. Uh, accuracy and the fastest most accurate shooter is always going to win but overall i see the biggest points made up with speed right you can afford to drop you know charlie's even deltas um you can even miss you can even miss and hit no shoots um as long as your times are quick enough and i know there's the old saying you can't miss shoot, uh, fast enough to win um, I think in mini rifle you can get away with it a, a lot more, and I'm and I'm certainly seeing the main focus on mini rifle of being is being speed and agility. You still need to maintain a minimum level of accuracy. Um, you know, and what I found in this year is I focus too much on accuracy and less on speed, being very accurate but just not quick enough. You know, there were some competitions where I was like the, one of, if not the most accurate shooters, but the times were just too slow. And it's like, actually, I can afford to drop that accuracy. I, I really, for me, I think speed is really important in mini rifle. And that's why the gun is, is built like that. It's it's incredibly lightweight. It's incredibly nimble and agile. Um, so, yes, overall, uh, a very good... And I'm not just saying all of this because of the ov overall result. Um, and, and this is why I think as well that it was a real, I think, a real good 
sort of verse versatile or, or it was a good overall test of everybody because of how close the results were um so i managed to secure my highest place finish in a level three match ever in any discipline um still only managed fourth i do the elusive win or uh, elusive placing um well it eludes me uh but it's you know i'm working on it but just the difference and this is agonizing right so between you know fourth and first is less than two percent now it's hard to give any sort of you know if you don't know about ipsc and the way it's it's scored um you know it's hard to to really quantify how close that is but it, it's pretty much like a gnat's fart right it's it's pushing a little quicker here it's it's not having you know that issue you know or that mistake there like it is so so close um and it's not it's not just the top four it's not you know necessarily as frustrating for me that it was more than possible i know there were multiple places where i could made up that difference for the win um but even just the top 10 you know, the top 10 being separated by 10%, like, it's absolutely incredible. So it's great to see, you know, people have, you know, like, you know, um, Arian, you know, Ar Arian has made big improvements. I think myself have made big improvements. So to see people sort of coming up and improving and competing for the win is, is fantastic to see. That's that's how a sport evolves. But if, you, um, if you've ever see, heard of a... Uh, an app called practice practice score competitor it allows you to go into the scores and, and adjust it not i mean to cheat i mean it's purely for your own interest um but i had one this is one of the lovely things about 22 ammunition and it's um it's reliability uh no matter even the best stuff out there isn't always 100 percent reliable but there was on the toilet stage i had a light strike so you know pull the trigger click you've got to recognize what it is rack it and get back onto um get get back onto the gun and we i looked at it and it was about two seconds um and i had a number of light strikes um that day it, it, i think it averaged to about between paul and i averaged to about one every hundred which doesn't sound too um too out of the ordinary for um for two two but you know that one two second on that one stage uh, was the difference between coming fourth um, or coming second like if I if that hadn't have happened on that stage I would have been second um, and I think if it hadn't have happened on a, another stage or at one particular stage again I would have been win so that's like the margins you're looking at which is for me as a competitor like it's it's fantastic like you you really do this is why we worry about the the absolute smallest details because it it does it makes the difference between coming first or coming fourth or or even coming tenth it's really not you know you have that one stage that something goes wrong you know it could cost you the the entire competition um so yeah had a brilliant time at the welsh uh, mini rifle championship i you know i said it last year i'm gonna say it again i think you should really go to every single match if you can only go to one I really think you should go to the to the welsh it's just such a a, a varied match and you you know you see so many different stages and get to experience so so many different sort of shooting styles uh, and you really have to be able to switch it on and turn it off you have to be able to pace yourself but also just go absolute full full speed uh, and also another big point with the welsh mini rifle championship is we do have a magload magazine update uh <laughs> Yes, don't don't laugh. Um, so, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, I'm sure most of you that are watching are very acutely aware. Uh, we are still in development of, uh, or we we are going to release a universal two two AR fifteen uh, magazine built for competition, built to replace, let's say, less hardier mags that are on the market. It is going to be working with. Uh, you know, out of the box they will work with any better mag adapter or the 1522 and there will be uh, additional adapters that you will clip into the magazine which means you can then use them with the likes of the Tipman, the um the chris defiance or even remove your better mag adapters and use them straight with any mil spec ar-15 um as i'm sure a, a lot of you are aware 
uh, it has taken a lot, lot longer than expected to uh, to release the magazines, uh, mainly because of well, I, I guess uh, us slightly underestimating how many iterations it would take with the injection molders to to get on top of things. But this weekend made an absolute massive step. For those of you that that know or don't know, you know, Magload is is driven by competition and something that we are really passionate about is competition proving our products not just designing something you know testing it in a um, a normal test bay you know you could go into a range and just blatten a few rounds before we release something we like to run it in competition ourselves we first like to you know we need to test that does it actually give you an edge in competition does it work in a competition environment can it live up to the abuse that you're going to give your gun in competition like you will do things to your gun within a competition that you wouldn't even think of just out testing on the range you know things happen you you'll beat it you throw it you knock it um you'll get it in all sorts of weird and wonderful angles and to really test something you have to you have to take it into competition to to sign it off and Obviously, you can't take something into competition if you're not confident that it's going to give you an edge if you're if you're going to finish it. And, well, the, the mag sort of got the biggest sign-off that they could potentially have got uh, with uh, Connors running them the whole weekend um, at, at Wales. So those are the Magload um, Universal 2.2 magazines being run in a Level 3 IPSC uh, competition. Um, they do exist. They're not. They're not mythical. They. They are. They're running. They are working, um, and they look sexy as fuck. Uh, <laughs> that's my official unbiased review right there. Uh, but the the biggest thing about this is in Connor's first. What are you doing, Facebook? There we go. In his first time in standard. So. New, new product alert um, so Connor's switched from open division where you're allowed to use an optic um, to standard where you have to use iron sights and in his first time in competing in standard division he ended up winning it and actually ended up taking the first ever president's medal in the UK for standard division in mini rifle which was kind of like you know everybody that had been trying for years to get the get build standard uh, into a division big enough to be able to have president's medals and all these people that have been training and competing for all this time within standard and then Connor's just sort of rocks up and shits all over everybody <laughs> um but you know he is a um an awesome shooter and he gets on very well obviously with iron sights so not only have the magazines been you know used in competition they were used to win so i don't really know what more of an endorsement they need, uh, but you know, obviously there is still testing. the The magazines ran flawlessly. We've got them to a point where we know where they need to be, what what needs to happen with them, um, and the final changes are are going through to the uh, the injection molders. Uh, it's really it's up to them now. You know, we we know where where it needs to be to be able to sort of give that performance um, and that's really been the issue is like you know you can design something on paper then you've got to bring in manufacturers tolerance and this that and the other and you know let's say artifacts from manufacturing and you've got to then design around all of those and it's it's always sort of two steps forward one step back two step forward one step back um i think we, we've we're i think we're on the last we we only need one step forward now so you know if we go Two forward, one back. We'll be, we be we we will be where we need to be. So they are currently implementing the changes on those magazines. Uh, as long as what they produce is is you know what we've said. Like, look, just just make it like this now. This is this is it. This this runs. This is competition proven. This this will win a match. Um, as long as they do that, we will be good to do, we will be good to go. So we are now adjusting it and saying um, pre orders will be out. Um, it, it could be even the end of this month, but we're probably going for November now. Uh, again, apologies to everyone and thank you to everyone that has waited so patiently uh, for these. But yeah, it's a big, big update, big step forward. Um, it, they 
they run like they they run they're using competitions they're they're winning so it really shouldn't be uh, a lot longer now until we're able to start sending out uh, pre-orders um i'm sorry to say you know dan yours are going to have to be in the second batch now there's no way around it everybody everybody else you're going to get yours in the first batch we are going we are going to specifically order like how many has dan ordered like four or five we're specifically going to order four or five less than what we actually need just to guarantee that dan's is in the uh in the second batch um <laughs> if you if you want to see the um oh actually could i uh i'm just gonna get it up just get it up for you right now not not like that that's that's on a different website uh here we go so for those of you that don't know, there is a, a little app called Discord, and there is also the UK uh, shooting Discord. I always always have to be very careful showing you guys um, anything on here. It is it is dangerous. Um, all of the FLDs watching the stream tonight must be getting through the popcorn like a pisshead through a kebab. Maybe you're maybe not right wrong. Um, so this this is this is Discord. Um, it is a dark and strange place. I I am not going to allow live feeds of the feed of Discord. Certainly not in general uh, shenanigans. That is is far too da too dangerous for my liking. But what I will do is find. Uh, one certain video that was posted earlier today if you guys want to join us in discord it is um just a, a place to hang out and chat everything uk guns and more i'll put the invite link so you can check that in the stream um uh you can check you know click on that link and, and go into to discord and you can join all of the these wonderful non-degenerate people um and you get to join in with all sorts of fun and games god you guys do go on don't you this, this was only only later today so basically this this sums up dan dan getting his magazines where is it 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 god you guys have been going on at it we couldn't we couldn't resist a little bit of banter Dan's dreams of getting mags. Crushed. Uh, <laughs> um, yep, there, there we go. That's a, that's a little taste of what goes on in, in the Discord. We're all degenerates in here. <laughs> You're also on watch lists. Um, Callum, no Discord on stream. Oop. As you have Discord open, check your messages later. Thank you for the reminder. I, I will do. Thanks, Black Guinea Pig. Um, Dan's ordered a thousand to have them in pink. <laughs> uh, English using. Thanks for that. Um, good to see it in black and white. Um, thanks for the help. See you later. No worries at all. Paul IPSC. If I'd have changed my mics for Delta, I'd have been second at 99. I know, but you you miss. No, you don't have anyone else to blame for that, apart from me telling you the incorrect holdover for certain targets. But anyway, um, like genuinely, like light strike on ammunition. Not. It's just oh, so so frustrating. But no, it's um, overall in that comp. You know, there were a num. There were one or two stages where looking back I could have pushed harder I could have gone faster um you know it was well within you know but that's that's what's going to make it so interesting next year there, there were a good well you know easily you know it's easy to say like anybody could win it but really just a little bit extra here a little bit extra there and it would really change change the result so it's going to be highly competitive uh next year uh, one of my favourite matches is right next to a confirmed NSA facility in my country. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's uh, just just watch out for the drones. 
Will the mags work on full auto lowers? No comment. Um, well, I can't imagine any... Re if you lawfully had a full auto 2.2 AR-15 lower, lawfully, I can't imagine any reason why the mags wouldn't work with them. Um, we would, if somebody out there has the relevant licensing, we would be more than happy to provide some magazines for testing as long as you could make us uh, also have the relevant authority to be able to pull the trigger. Um, or fly us out to America, like whatever. Maybe that's what we should do. Promo video, yeah. Write it off, business expense, right? Marketing. <laughs> Has Dan just gone? Has Dan, I haven't seen any of Dan. Usually when he gets a little bit of ribbon, he likes to chip back here and there. We still love you, Dan, don't go. You're, you're still the super mod in my heart. Oh, oh no, he did. He did. He did chip in around my height. Uh, matching white watch. Yes, I did go a little bit, uh, a little bit silly. Um, we, we, it's Arius's fault. Um, as you all guys all know, I am quite big into my watches and, you know, it's now a thing that you can't call yourself a watch lover unless you have a G-Shock. And of course my, my watch matches my rifle. It is, it is black and white like the like the law should be that should be my new catchphrase english shooting teaching you the black and white of the law and everything in between um but no seriously the law should just be black and white it should be this or that not like it's open to interpretation uh any, anyway um on that note i think we are going to call it there again if you want to hang out in discord afterwards check out that link go through it is a great community despite the banter the shenanigans this that and the other it is a really useful resource to to ask questions, to learn more about the sport, about firearms ownership here uh, in the UK. So please do go and uh, and check it out. Just um, just be careful. Uh, God dear. If anybody watches uh, Nico Leonard, then um, then you'll get the reference of God dear. I just can't say it in a uh, in an angry Northern Irish accent that well. Um, it's a good excuse to test them CMMG kits run in auto lowers if you have the right sears yeah okay less on that that sounds very five years in prison to me uh, <laughs> but anyway guys before you all head off hit that like button if you haven't already it does make a big difference make sure you subscribed if you're not already as well and again if you want to if you want to support the channel uh, you can head over to englishshooting.org uh, and you can pick yourself up some sick merch. Um, I actually need to do a new hat order, ma mainly because my current one is dirty and I've, I've, I'm running low. And I don't want to take it out of, you know, it'll be, I'll take one and go, yeah, there we go, that, that one's for me. And then someone will order one, I won't have, have one. So I'm probably going to do some new, um, probably going to do some new caps and probably even patches and stickers now that we've got the vinyl cutter working but if you do want to pick up some stickers some caps and merch and help the channel you can over head over to englishshooting.org uh, and you can buy your merch to your heart's uh, content or as um, as i saw uh, alex dale member for two months only es fans you can become a uh, join the es uh, es only es fans uh, and and support the channel uh, that way but yeah i hope you've all enjoyed it uh, tonight guys uh, thank you everybody for um for joining and getting involved and we will see you next week uh we will there's going to be a number of videos coming soon again i'm going to do the getting hold of a gun um legally under the age of the eight uh, over the 18 i'm doing going to do the lead co consultation and there's going to be a load of match videos so again thanks for watching really hope you've enjoyed it like share subscribe join and of course as always hope to see you soon